in chapter seven of Lyme, the first epidemic of climate change, what did you mean by an indestructible pathogen? An indestructible pathogen is obviously a reference to Borrelia burgdorferi and its ability to persist. This goes back to what I was saying about is Lyme a chronic illness? Does that spirochete stay in your body? And there is a lot of evidence. There are studies being done uh, within the last 10 years and currently that show that the everyday antibiotics that we apply to Lyme disease leave a certain number of surviving uh, bacteria behind. And the ways in which that they're showing that Lyme persisters can survive possibly in the human body is by, first of all, um, taking the Lyme disease bug, putting it in a Petri dish or a test tube, and dousing it with the frontline antibiotics that we use every day, as well as many other antibiotics in the FDA library. And we're finding that often many of these persisters um, live another day. We have also um, conducted experiments at the um, University of uh, California, Davis, for example, where mice have been infected with the Lyme disease pathogen. We wait a while, we test them for um, the pathogen, we see if they um, test positive. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, as with people. Um, we've also done this with monkeys at Tulane University. There's a terrific researcher there by the name of Monica Embers who's done some breakthrough work. Infecting monkeys with Lyme disease, testing them, finding that sometimes, just like with human beings, they don't test positive even when we know they have been infected. They, um, their, their immune systems simply are not producing the antibodies that, that this test would respond to. So it's kind of an explanation as to why some people might not test positive. But then in these mouse experiments, in these monkey experiments, we give them the frontline antibiotics that we give to people and we wait a while. With the mice, they're euthanized, their tissues are studied, and we see that the Lyme disease spirochete is alive and well in these animals. So we find it both in monkeys, we find it in mice, and monkeys, by the way, are the closest model to human beings that there is. This is a standard way of proving a concept. And so, you know, when I say indestructible pathogen, we're talking about the Lyme disease spirochete. We have to come up with better weapons against Borrelia burgdorferi than we have now, because a, a round of doxycycline or amoxicillin simply isn't cutting it for a lot of people. And these experiments on monkeys, on mice, in test tubes are explaining why. Um, the Lyme disease pathogen has incredible um, abilities. And it goes back, I suppose, to the fact that they, they have been around <laughs> in circulation for maybe 15 to 20 million years ago that we know. But it, when we're infected with Lyme disease, for example, with that, that spirochete, um, our um, immune system recognizes it, sees something, and says, okay, I have to start attacking this. And it does so. We do have some natural ability to fight it off. But then what the spirochete does is, I'm going to change the way I look. I'm going to drop some of these, what we call outer surface proteins, that our immune system is responding to. And, oh, our immune system is caught off guard. We don't have the ability to recognize it anymore. So it does things like that. It um, moves into our lymph nodes. And we have found in, um, again, animal studies that it can disable our germinal centers, which are key things in our lymph nodes, which help us fight off infections. Um, other things it does, when it's under assault, when it's under environmental stress, namely uh, antibiotics are trying to kill it, our immune system is trying to kill it. It says, okay, wait a minute, I'm gonna go into hiding. 
I'm going to change the way I, I appear. I'm going to go into this little round body form. Maybe I'm going to go under these things called biofilms. And I'm just going to hang out there. And I'm going to wait for the coast to be clear. And, you know, we don't know how long each and every one of these organisms hides under these things or stays in these, these shapes. But we do know that they reemerge after a period of wellness. And we see this in mice, we see this in monkeys, and we certainly see this in people. They feel better. And then, maybe months, maybe years later, they become ill and symptomatic again. In chapter 11 of Lyme, the first epidemic of climate change, what did you mean by a Lyme-free world? A Lyme-free world is certainly something that I, I greatly wish for. Um, I don't think that we're ever going to get to that point. Certainly not um, given the conditions that we have to deal with today in terms of so many ticks out there and so many pathogens, but also in terms of where the research is. We need to do a lot more research and spend a lot more money to figure out how to tackle ticks in the environment. Um, we have done very little to prevent this from accelerating. Year after year, the toll from Lyme disease in the United States and in many other countries, in France, in the Netherlands, in Russia, in China, in Australia, the number of people who are affected by this is going up. So there's no evidence that, you know, tucking your pants into your socks when you're in a, um, a field is working to the extent that it should. I'm not saying don't do that. Take every precaution that you can. Don't walk in tall weeds, for example. Don't even brush up against them. Wear light clothing. Wear cl clothing that is um, impregnated with something called permethrin. This kills ticks. They land on your sock if it's impregnated with permethrin. They die. It's not even just a repellent. So we need to do a lot more research on, on um, how to prevent Lyme disease. Um, we um, have um, tools in our arsenal. Um, something called newt ketone is a natural um, substance that is found in different places in nature, in particular in um, grapefruit seeds, I believe. And People have been fighting for a great, a long period of time. Let's put this stuff into soap. And experiments have been done, and it will kill any ticks on you. So you use this stuff, it's, it's a harmless substance. And after you come out, you know, come in from outside, you shower, and you don't have to worry about ticks. You don't have to worry about ticks on your children. But we don't have these basic things in our um, arsenal of weapons against ticks. Um, they are doing some studies in um, New York right now in which they are putting out these little uh, boxes. And um, basically, a mouse is invited to come into this box because it's going to get a tasty treat when it comes through this little, I call them car washes for, for um, mice, because when they pass through the, the box, they're doused with a little bit of a substance that will kill ticks on them. And as I said, mice are the prime reservoir for Lyme disease. So if we can stop ticks from biting mice, <laughs> we can stop that cycle of Lyme disease in the environment. Um, as part of that same experiment where they're putting these little bait boxes out into backyards in several hundred um, properties, um, they're also spraying the properties with a um, a fungus, and it's a fungus that kills ticks. Again, it's a natural um, organism, and it's not going to be harmful to us, and it will kill ticks. But this is very expensive, this kind of tre treatment for properties. And the other thing I've mentioned beyond, beyond questioning whether this is really um, practical is that the research that's being done is being funded largely by nonprofit organizations. Nonprofit organizations that raise money for tick-borne research are stepping into a huge breach. Government has, for way too long, and this is starting to change, 
but way too long, just sort of abdicated its responsibility for this. Um, the National Institutes of Health last year spent about maybe 60 to to $100 per case of Lyme disease. It's the um, second leading infectious disease in the country. At the same time, it has spent, it spent well over $100,000 per case of HIV AIDS. I'm not saying that that is not an important um, area to research, but we largely have answers to HIV AIDS. We have a test, we have effective treatments. With Lyme disease, we have neither. So we really have to get to the point where we're spending the money on a huge scale. Um, about, I guess it was four years ago, when um, the Summer Olympics were on in Rio de Janeiro, the Zika virus emerged. It was a mosquito-borne illness. And um, babies were found to be born with horribly deformed heads by virtue of the fact that their mothers had been bitten by mosquitoes and infected with the Zika virus. This caused huge and, you know, rightfully so, um, response and concern um, in many countries and in the United States. And then Zika arrived in Miami, and we had some cases of Zika. And within short order, within six months, Congress ad allocated $1.1 billion for Zika. That is amazing. Somehow, mosquitoes, things that fly, are much scarier than these tiny little things that hide in the grass and get you when you're not looking. Um, and that's been the story of Lyme disease. Very little research money for Lyme disease, a lot for mosquito-borne illnesses like Zika, like West Nile virus, $2,000 per case. Now, I don't think many people know um, victims of Zika virus in the United States, even of West Nile virus, but almost anybody can point to someone who they know who has had Lyme disease or, or, or you know, they themselves have had Lyme disease.